Hello, 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 and welcome to the PlayStation Podcast. My name is Sean Jackson. I'm your host here today, and I am very privileged to introduce to you an artist that has worked in ceramics you know, for such a long time in Australia and also has extensive uh, knowledge and training from Japan, from Kyoto. Uh, I proudly introduce to you Alistair White. Thank you, Alistair White, for coming on the podcast today. It's great to have you. Uh, you're welcome. So, Alistair, tell me a bit about yourself. Uh, you have such an extensive uh, contribution to the ceramics community, and you've accomplished so much within your own academic pursuits. Uh, but where did it all start from? What's what's your background, and how did you get involved in ceramics in the beginning? Um, <clears throat> Well, you're asking for a long story there, well, but I'll, I'll try and keep it a little shorter. That's okay. Um, we love long stories my, here. <laughs> good. Now, my, my parents were missionaries in what was the New Hebrides and is now called Vanuatu. And my first few years were actually in the islands. And uh, my mother was a doctor and set up a medical clinic, but she also painted she was always painting wherever she went. So we still have paintings of hers from the islands. And my father was a, a you know, a, a missionary and was responsible for many um, villages around uh, the islands. And um, um, then there was my grandmother. My grandmother spent 20 years with her husband living in China. And she was also, um, a well-trained painter and artist. She was trained by painters of the Heidelberg School and um, she painted in oils as well as watercolors. But um, having been to China for 20 years, she had a lovely collection of beautiful Chinese porcelains. And I found those most intriguing as a child. And I loved listening to her stories of her travels. After her husband died, um, in many ways, it freed her up and she took to traveling around the world in ships. And we'd often see her off um, in the docks down in Melbourne, Station Pier, and throw the streamers and uh, as the ship departed and have fun running around the ship and checking out her cabin before she left. And she always brought back something uh, as a present. So it was always fun to see Grandma. But um, my father um, uh, died reasonably young, you might say, as a result of war injuries. And um, that was about the time I finished school. And I was looking at what I thought I would go into. And um, I got a placement at La Trobe University, but um, it wasn't very practical. And um, I've always been a very practical sort of person. So I applied to a ceramic course in Bendigo and that was my first sort of uh, in-depth look at ceramics. I really enjoyed that course. Nice, nice. Um, as you might already be aware, uh, we had you and Craig on the show uh, not long ago, uh, and he's also comes from that area. Did you guys uh, know each other in the early days? Well, he was well after. He was well after me. <laughs> yeah. No, he, he's he's quite a young man compared to me. He was uh, he went through that school. He probably knew about me when he was at college, but um, I'd been in Japan some time before he came. Nice, nice. So, um, from your time, um, how did you make your way over to Japan? Because uh, coming from Bendigo, there's a quite a um, high contrast between <laughs> living in Bendigo and um, going to Japan. So what, yeah, well, what started that? Well, we were very lucky in my final year at uh, college there. We had a, a lecturer come from Kyoto. He'd graduated from the University of Art in Kyoto and done postgraduates. And he came out, his name was uh, Shunichi Inoue. And um, he was quite inspiring because he worked in such a different way to any of the other lecturers. And, um, you know, he got to know that I had an interest in oriental ceramics and uh, would like to 
follow that pursuit more. I tried to make porcelain bodies when I was in Bendigo, but with the local materials available, um, I didn't have much of a success rate. And my, my clays were very short and hard to throw and not very translucent. But um, he encouraged me to write to one of the uh, professors in Kyoto who taught porcelain and see if I could get into his workshop. And um, I got a firm no back to that because he didn't know me. And then he said, oh, look, just try for the postgrad course at the University of Art. And um, I actually got a positive response from that. So after I finished my college uh, in Bendigo, I actually worked with a pottery in Hillsville and also with another potter near Bendigo. So it was almost two years before I managed to organize a place at the university and head off. Um, I bought a round the world ticket and went to England and Scotland where some of my uh, relatives um, you know, I come from mostly Scottish and Irish, and then flew over um, the top end to, you know, over Russia to Alaska, a brief stop there. It's my, my first and only visit to America. And, um, you know, it was very strange seeing guys in 10 gallon hats driving Jeeps around and two or three meters of snow beside the runway. And then we flew on from there to Japan and my first view of Japan was the setting sun over Mount Fuji as we flew into Tokyo. So um, that was quite a moving experience. Beautiful. So and uh, from, from Tokyo, I stayed overnight. Someone very luckily um, saw me standing around looking very bewildered at the, uh, the ticket desk, not having booked anything prior. And he took me to a youth hostel in, in Tokyo. And I woke up the next morning to, uh, you know, at five o'clock in the morning to these crazy Japanese outside doing exercises to music. And I thought, where have I come to? <laughs> but um, I caught a bus that day and went all the way down to Kyoto. And the same thing happened that night too. Another man um, saw this foreigner who looked rather bewildered and lost and took me to another youth hostel. So it was rather an interesting introduction to Japan. Very, but, um, very nice. You know, after I, I sorted things out and got to the university and found the lecturer that I'd been corresponding with. His name was Professor Condol. He'd actually spent time in America and his English was good. So I could communicate. But um, it took me six months before I could really start to talk much to people. I had to do, get on and do some serious study. How did you feel um, studying a degree overseas, um, yet one being in, in Japan, uh, that must have been extremely challenging, uh, especially with such a, a vast cultural difference and also a language barrier to work your way around? How, how was that experience for you? Uh, well, well, when I first went into the... Um, the office where uh, the admissions office at the university, um, they sort of looked at me in despair and said, you don't speak enough Japanese. But the uh, Professor Kondo intervened on my behalf and said, look, we'll organize and apply for a, a Japan uh, foreign in, um, ministry scholarship. It's a Mombusho scholarship. And uh, that was successful. And I actually spent the first six months commuting back and forth to Osaka to the Foreign University of Studies, learning intensive Japanese. And then I was able to enter the university and um, you know, start doing things and also continue my language studies at another language school in Kyoto. But the, um, I could basically, as a postgrad student, I could choose what lectures I went to. I used to go and um, um, attend the calligraphy class and um, also listen in on the lectures of the um, the man uh, who had written a lot of books on glazes. Um, a lot of this was still above my head, but it was, a, it was not really a set course being a postgrad. It was, uh, I soon found out that you had to set your own course and chase lecturers and ask questions and also 
uh, watch and learn from the the more um, uh, completed students in the course. In Japan, they do four years uh, as sort of undergraduate and then two years postgraduate. So it's a long course. Mm. So by the time these students get to postgrad, they're actually uh, very competent. And uh, you know, probably some of the uh, other students who are still friends of mine um, were the most help in many ways. Uh, with their broken English, they try and teach us naughty words and uh, encourage us to, um, you know, play up. And um, but they also taught us a lot of technique and also were very helpful. And uh, there were also two or three other foreign students at the university at the time. There was an Englishman, and there was a, a Swiss girl, and there was this man called Pascal, uh, Frenchman, who came along. And um, yeah, they were all quite interesting characters. There was also another uh, girl there at the university studying lacquer, and uh, her name was Francoise. So there was there was a small community of foreigners there, and um, you know we could get on and communicate well with them and find out what the ropes were. <laughs> nice, that's awesome. Like so I was at the university for three years. And during that time, it actually moved campus to a new site. So everything had to be upended and shifted. And um, then I went and was invited by this porcelain master who came as a part-time lecturer to come and work in his workshop in Kyoto for another 12 months. And um, that was really good. Do you feel um, the education in Japanese university, do you feel that... Um, was it very, um, the ceramics, ceramics course, was it focused on foundational skills or developing like muscle memory and practices uh, as opposed, or was it uh, focused more on theory and uh, history? Um, or oh, you, you had a, yes, you had a big mixture of everything. For the intake of the first year students, they were definitely taught the fundamental skills uh, that you need, how to throw, um, how to knead your clay using the chrysanthemum wedging, um, learning to throw off the hump, uh, learning to use basic tools. They were given a good rounding. There are a lot of good subjects that you get from history, uh, theory of glazing. Um, but as the further you went in the course, especially in the more the postgrad area, they were looking um, beyond the basics of skills to more artistic ventures and artistic areas. So the, this particular school is really turning out artist potters and not um, you know throwers for the industry. Really, there was another school in Kyoto that was um, you know like a skills-based school only for people who are going to become disciples of other masters and go and work in industry and just throw pots and um, be a workforce for the ceramic industry. The ones at the University of Art were all basically learning to be artists and ceramic artists. But of course, they had to gain a good grounding of ceramics skills along the way. And they certainly got that. That's good. That's good. Um, on, on your resume, it shows that you continued to stay in Japan afterwards and you went on to a position as a deshi or like a, a student or apprentice. Uh, yes, yes. How, how did you find that experience? Um, that was probably where I learned the most in the way of skills. Um, because it was very disciplined. I was in a, a porcelain workshop in Kyoto with a very, very high standard. Mm. And, um, you know, I had a really wonderful master potter there. Um, they had what they call the shokunin son, who did nothing but throw all day and finish things off. And his level of skill was absolutely mind boggling. Um, you know, beautiful fine eggshell, thin porcelain. And um, then there was one other deshi, a Japanese boy, who was purely going through the deshi system and learning. And that's about seven years in Japan. 
and um, I was very fortunate to be there only for one year, but uh, a lot of my skills were above the other deshi because I, you know, studied in Australia and also had been at the university for three years. And um, my, um, I travelled around Japan quite a lot on a motorcycle and seen other areas, so I was a little more worldly wise than the other deshi. But uh, no, that was a wonderful experience, um, seeing how fine porcelain is made in a traditional way. My, my teacher had uh, three sort of different areas to work in. There was the, um, what you call a Tonya-san, who was the uh, ceramic agent who'd come around with orders and um, he would place orders that were made for traditional work. And then my teacher had his own personal work that he made for uh, the craft um, group that he belonged to. And um, that was far more Scandinavian and uh, modern in design and a lot more simply made in many ways. Beautiful austere work. Mm. And um, then he was also a member of the Soldasha group in Kyoto which uh, ran for about 50 years before they folded it. And that was an avant-garde art group. And for that, he made um, his own form of um, sculpture, really, in porcelain. And that was fascinating, too. So he was, he was quite a diverse man. Interesting, because uh, I was interested about your experience in Kyoto because um, Kyoto's ceramics uh, compared to other districts in Japan is very focused on porcelain. Uh, yes, it, that's, that's largely because that's where the um, imperial house was and um, they'd had quite a strong influence mostly from China uh, they brought in beautiful Ming Dynasty porcelains mm. and uh, for the court, but the focus was very much on making wares for the the court uh, initially. But it became very much a strong porcelain area. There are potters, of course, around Kyoto that make all sorts of things, but there is a real focus uh, in Japan. Porcelain is essentially made in uh, Kutani, uh, up on the the Japan Sea. And in Arita and Imari, down mm. in Kyushu, um, in Tobe, in Shikoku, and in Seto. So Seto is much more of an industrial area. Uh, so there are specific areas where you've got the specialist area of porcelain, but Kyoto porcelain is very distinctive um, as compared to the other areas. You can look at pieces that are made and say, okay, that's from Kutani. It's highly decorated with on glaze enamels and golds and other things. And then Arita porcelain has its own unique sort of brand of uh, colors that are used. Um, the Nabashima ware, which used to be made for a warlord, and uh, he gave the potter's samurai status to work with him and looked after them, but they, they weren't allowed to escape. They were like his captive um, artisans. The, the, the work that was done in uh, the Nabashima ware has never been topped for quality. It's quite amazing. And he used to use that for gifts for the emperor and the shogun and other warlords. They were his own private um, artisans, but he looked after them well. And they produced amazing work. You, know, you can find examples of this in, in books and also in the museum down in Arita. So, um, you know, traveling around Japan is a really interesting thing to do. There's many areas where they do totally different things, a bit like the area of Bizen, where it's, uh, they don't use many tools and um, things are finished off with bamboo knives and they fire in kilns without any glaze. And uh, it's how they wrap things in seaweed and the long length of firings. It, it's utterly different from somewhere like Kyoto. And you've got Shigaraki, the clay that they use in Shigaraki is very rocky and stony and it breaks with silica and they do lovely long wood firings and it's it's again totally different. So mm. these all all these areas are very distinctive and um, it's a fascinating journey to travel around and see them. 
Yes, yes. I found that uh, my in the, my own case as well. Uh, one, one trip I travelled all the way from um, Kyoto all the way across through to the western side of Japan, district by district. And it's just absolutely amazing to see all the the, the contrasts of each district's style. <laughs> absolutely, yes. And you go up to Hokkaido and they've got to have heated studios because it drops down to 30 below <laughs> yes. in the winter. <laughs> And they use lots of volcanic ash in their glazers because they've got active volcanoes up there. So, yes, again, fascinating. I'm interested to um, learn of how they deal with um, uh, the clay freezing because uh, once the clay becomes oh, yeah, frozen, probably... it changes its makeup. Yeah, no, it'll... <laughs> oh, it'll shatter. Yes. yes no, even, <laughs> even where I live in Warburton in Victoria, you get a cold night in the winter and it drops below zero. If you've got wet pots, they'll shatter. So they've got to keep the studios heated 24 hours a day so that it won't drop below zero. That's the only way. Mm. So, you know, often studios are far better made than ones in Australia, a bit like their houses. You know, up north, they've got airlock systems to get into the house. The Genkan is like the airlock and you shut the outer door and then you step up onto the level of the house and you go in and they don't lose air and heat out of the house that way. But their houses are also far better made because um, if you dig down in somewhere like Hokkaido, uh, you'll find you hit hoar frost and the ground is frozen all year round. So, you know, it's a very different place to live. Yes, definitely, definitely. The weather will definitely affect um i guess your living style and um also as it's the ceramics is their uh, trade the course of trade then they want to do anything that they can to protect that uh at what point in japan was it in japan or in australia that you started um working with uh translucent porcelain or lear learning about it um Oh, look, I, I learned about it initially in uh, Australia. I knew about uh, translucent porcelain from the pieces that my grandmother had brought back and had in her collection. And uh, it's something that uh, I was particularly interested to follow. Um, I did go and choose one of the hardest paths for a potter um, <laughs> because it's a long road to learn about porcelain. Uh, but, you know, I really learned to use it in Japan and the quality of the clays over there is superb. You know, they're, they're not made up bodies like you get in Europe uh, or England. They're, they're often what they call tolseki, which is a natural clay that's mined, or it's a mineral basically that's mined uh, in its primary deposit form and ground and processed. And it, you can use it as a porcelain. It's, it's wow. quite amazing. If you, if you have read uh, Steve Harrison's books on uh, his his travels with porcelain clays, you'd have a much better understanding. They're well worthwhile reading. Definitely. Uh, I think I've got one, one yeah. of his books in my library, but I haven't gone through it in depth yet. <laughs> yes. Oh, no, he's, he's written some very interesting books about, um, you know, his, his research into clays, um, you know, porcelain clays on five continents. Um, the, he's been to Cornwall and dug up the China clays down there and the beginnings of porcelain in Europe and um, also Korea, uh, right up near the, the border with North Korea, you know, and also in uh, Jingdezhen in China. And he's been out and seen where they dig, dig the clays and, of course, in Australia. Um, but, you know, he... he had an exhibition in Sydney for a year or so ago, looking at all these different bodies and the clays and the translucency. And uh, that was a culmination of many years of study and research. Yes, didn't he have an exhibition um, of the what pots is, from the bushfire? Gallery. Oh yes, yes, that was far more recently. Yes. He was a lucky man to escape that. Yes. And if you've been reading his blog, you can see how he's been rebuilding his studio in the most amazing way over the last 12 months. Uh, I really like, completely. I really like a lot of his um, uh, material about uh, kiln building because he's such a uh, expert 
at um, uh, Kiln that's, Building that's his, and Design. That's his area of expertise. Yeah. Yes, he's, he's got his PhD in kiln building and wood fire. So um, my, the wood kiln that I actually use at home is one of his design, a brewery box with a throat and a main chamber. So and, you, um, use a, due to forest, you, you use a brewery box? Yes, for wood. I, I've got a variety of kilns at my place. I've got uh, two or three gas kilns, one small electric kiln, and also a wood fire. Wow. And um, uh, the odd raku kiln or two and piles of bricks that I can put together for uh, raku or pit firing. You, you accumulate a lot when you've been in the business for nearly 50 years. <laughs> uh, I can't wait till I get to that point. <laughs> Uh, so with yeah. su such a, a, a vast amount at your disposal, what, what are your preferences? Like, uh, are you, do you love working with the wood, wood firing or do you like using the, the gas or electric kilns for something specific or what, 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 oh, what's I, your go-tos? Yeah, I use everything. You know, I, I'll go through different stages. Um, most of my porcelain work I put through the main gas kiln because mm. I've got really good control over that. But putting porcelain in wood firing is also an interesting thing because of the ash fallout. Um, I essentially built a wood kiln about six years or so ago, uh, partly to teach myself wood firing because I've been helping um, a village in Vanuatu re-establish a, a cottage industry of pottery. They actually asked me to come and help them over 10 years ago because they'd lost a lot of the early skills. And the only way to fire in Vanuatu is with wood because gas is way too expensive. Right. Um, they don't have electricity. It's only, you know, unless they've got small solar panels. And um, they certainly can't afford the setup that... Um, Steve Harrison has when he fires an electric kiln from solar. Um, so I built, I actually bought a, a kiln from a deceased estate, disassembled it. It was a gas fired four burner, quite a large kiln, shipped it all out to Vanuatu and rebuilt it as a wood firing kiln in Vanuatu. And it works beautifully. Awesome. But, uh, out there, they're mostly uh, firing to fairly low temperature. Their clays, won't allow them to go anything much beyond earthenware. Yeah, actually, uh, we'll have to talk more at a later point about that because uh, I have quite a few friends over in Vanuatu uh, through, through friends of friends, <laughs> and I was there. I was, oh, re should, uh, I was researching. You should send them out to this. Yes, you should send them out to this village. If they're potters, they'd love the place. It's you know I've sent out uh, kick wheels on yachts and all sorts of equipment so it's all basically set up to work and um, you know we, we send out a little bit of um, fritted glaze low firing fritted glaze so they can use one or two glazes so it's it's a good setup at this stage and it's on an outer island it's not on the main island where the capital is you just getting there is quite an adventure by air and by boat and um, you know it can take you a whole day to get in there I was researching a lot of these um, islands, uh, the Vanuatu and Solomon Islands, uh, even PNG, because uh, you know th these chain of islands they're all based on um, uh, volcanic lines formed o over yes. the ages. And the uh, I was interested in the clay deposits, the natural clay deposits in those areas, and if they were similar to clay de deposits in Japan, because Japan was formed much. Uh, at a diff different location, but also from similar procedures over time. So I was interested uh, yeah. about the mineral, well, mineral mineralogy there's a, there's a... makeup. <laughs> yes, yes. Now, I think you find that there's some really strong differences. Um, mm. You know, there's a, a really good book being written about the ceramics of Papua New Guinea and uh, researched over about 12 years. But um, And also it mentions the Solomon Islands and um, the northern parts of Vanuatu. Um, but the, there's, it's very, they're very heavily lime-based uh, coral islands, a lot of these, and there's a lot of lime in the soil as well. You've got to be very careful to try and keep the lime out of the clay. Um, Owen Rye 
wrote uh, when he was a an academic at the ANU years ago. He wrote a paper researching the Melanesian clays, and um, you know it's well worth. Uh, well, what I should do is look out. I've got a copy of it on my computer. I'll send you a copy. Um, uh, he he actually researched the Melanesian clays and um, had some interesting things to say about it. But Japan, the diversity of clay is so much more vast. It's a much, much mm. bigger island. You know, you're getting onto the realms of the size of New Zealand there. And the, it's a very old place and they've got lots of weathered rocks, primary deposits of clay. Mostly what you find in Vanuatu is weathered, washed, secondary clays that have got a lot of pollutants in them and other minerals. And they won't go up beyond about earthenware temperatures unless you add in a, you know, a lovely white high firing clay. Yeah, I found and that out a lot uh, from my, my own research. It was a very, um, the, the natural clays were very low, low fired clays, uh, ye yellow clays and red clays. So anything around like a terracotta or a, a earthenware um, base, but um, would it be extremely difficult to fire those up high. Um, yes, you were mentioning yes, it about the high lime factor. Uh, what happens to clay if it has too much lime? Ah, that's interesting. Um, look, I've fired pots in Vanuatu before I realized exactly how dangerous lime was. And they fired, but within a couple of days, this great big explosion and they completely shattered because the lime absorbs moisture and it expands. And it gets to a point where the uh, pot can't take it any longer and it just disintegrates completely. It's quite dramatic. Um, the, uh, the article that Aaron Rye uh, wrote, which is well worthwhile chasing, he gave it a really interesting name. It's called Keeping Your Temper Under Control. <laughs> and it's all about the temper that you add to clay. Oh, nice. So, uh, <laughs> nice twist. <laughs> it was a good play on words. Okay, so lime, I guess it would uh, react similar as if there was um, plaster, I guess, in, in, the, in the clay. Cause, uh, oh, ab absolutely. Well, plaster is calcium-based too. So yes. Yes, you don't want plaster in your clay and you certainly don't want lime. And everywhere you go in Vanuatu, you've got beautiful coral reefs and lime on the beaches. The beaches are all lime. They're all coral. And, um, you know, if you want to try and add sand to the clay to open it up, then you've got real trouble. you best to use volcanic ash instead. But you know, if you go to the museum in Port Vila and you look at what's there, you get some beautiful examples of, you know, funerary wares that are over 3,000 years old and they're very sophisticated. So they have had a very sophisticated ceramic culture in the past that they've largely lost. When, when you finished um, your training in Japan and you came back to Australia, was it at that point that you started your own stu studio? Um, well, you could say I had a studio even set up from um, when I was training in Bendigo initially. Um, in those days, all the students were encouraged to set up their own studios. And when it came to, um, you know, looking at what, students, the final year students had done for the year, um, the lecturers had to get in a car all together and they had to go and travel around to all the different students' studios to assess them there because they spent more time in their own studios by that stage than they did at college. So I had a studio initially set up, which I came back to, but where um, I came back with a, a Japanese wife and we came back to a very dry um, part of Victoria where it was virtually dead flat and dusty and um, the, the only water that was drinkable was what was in the tanks. The local <laughs> water was hard and it was a real shock to my wife. So we, we only stayed there about a year and then moved down to a much wetter, um, you know, more familiar sort of territory near Melbourne in the hills called Warburton. And that's much more like, in many ways, where she came from. She came from Hokkaido. And uh, you get nice, cool winters down here, and it's very wet. So water wasn't a problem down here. I see. Did you meet um, 
as students studying ceramics. Uh, was she involved with ceramics as well? Uh, not at all. Um, I, we'd, uh, as I said before, we had to move university to a new site while I was there. And I had to move clear across town, much closer to the new university. And um, she happened to be living in the apartment building. Uh, she was a, the head of a, the head teacher of a, a, the local kindergarten and um, daycare center that was run by a Shinto shrine. Right. And, um, yeah, so she, she had quite different skills from me. <laughs> Did she develop but, an um, interest and, in ceramics over time? Um, yes, but I think she's more interested in cooking food than cooking clay. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that, that's her area of interest. No, in the, in the old university, they used to keep a washing machine uh, on campus for students to use to wash towels and other odds and ends. And um, I lived nearby in a, a small tea house in the, uh, the garden of an old Japanese house. And my only access to washing was at the university. And when they moved universities, uh, they didn't want anything like that there. It was too clean and pristine. So they said, no, no, no more washing machines. So I had to look around for someone else to, um, who had a washing machine. And um, she happened to have one in the, uh, the, the first floor of this building. So I asked if I could borrow her washing machine. So that's where I met her, <laughs> over the washing machine. Oh, well, she's, she's very uh, inspirational to come to Australia and to be here with you and take on a whole new life here. Um, you're probably aware of my wife's is Japanese as well. And um, uh, the amount of things that shock <laughs> Japanese when they're here <laughs> is uh, uh, oh, look, when, crazy. <laughs> yes, when, when we, yes, when we came, she found it very hard. Initially in central Victoria, um, no access to any food uh, supplies that were Japanese. At the time, there was a total of three Japanese restaurants in Melbourne, that was it. Um, finding any uh, Japanese food, uh, there was one lady right down south who had opened up um, a garage in the back of her house and was bringing in a few things. But you, you go from there and look to today, um, there are Japanese restaurants everywhere, often run by Chinese or Koreans. And um, Japanese supply shops are also far more frequent. You can get almost anything you want now. But uh, when we first came back from Japan, it was it was tough. It was really tough. Mm. She had to learn to cook on a slow combustion wood stove, and that scared the hell out of her. Um, yeah, she, you know, it was all totally different. Yeah, so, at, know, those times, at, time at those times, it must have been a lot more difficult than the um, luxuries of first world. Uh, items that we have these days, because uh, I, I, I grew up out way out bush in western New South Wales and, and even back out then, there's still a lot of people living the old ways of life and from your times, wow, that's, it's, it's a very inspirational story. Oh, look, when I first came back from Japan with a wife, the, um, there were her confusions and difficulties to deal with, but mm. also there was no one in that local you know, town, uh, there was, you know, about four hours drive from Melbourne. There was no one there that had the slightest interest in where I'd been or understood what I'd experienced. I couldn't talk to anybody about it. They just weren't interested. And um, it was a very difficult transition coming back. I suffered far more cultural shock coming back to Australia than I ever did going the other way. Mm. And um, yes, it was not an easy transition. So when you came back, what was your focus then? Like, did you try to develop your own, uh, like, um, your own business in ceramics or what was your direction at that point? Um, well, at that point, I just wanted to, um, survive and make <laughs> some pots and try and sell them. And that was very hard initially. Um, it took me a while before I was able to organize to import some Japanese clay from Japan. So I used what was available and just tried to make things. Mm. And it was not at all easy. 
but um, you know, over time, I, I was able to establish a link with an import company and bring in a ton of porcelain at a time. Um, I'd learned to make my own tools in Japan um, as a result of the training I went through, especially with the master. And uh, so I was able to make my own tools and um, I'd purchased a lot of the beautiful tungsten carbide turning tools that you really need for turning porcelain. And over the years, I've uh, added to some of those. And um, there's um, a company or this guy in America called Philip Pabruco at Bison Tools. And he also makes and sells tungsten carbide tools and has developed beautiful loop tools in tungsten. Uh, when he was first starting out, um, I was in contact with him and I actually supplied him with all the Japanese shapes that they use for their tungsten carbide tools. And that was the basis to get him going. So over the years, he sent me a few odd tools that he's made. So I've got a small selection of um, lovely you know, American bison tools as well. So that's called bison but, tools. Uh, yes. And look, they're beautiful tools. If you want to invest in a tool that will last a lifetime, you can look him up online and um, you see the whole range of tools he's got. But, um, you know, to me, the Japanese tools are, you know, just if not um, better. And that's what I was trained with. So I use mm. mostly Japanese tools. Nice. nice. It must have been very difficult financially to take care of family and to get by at that uh, early point. Uh, what's, what happened along the way to, um, did things improve over time or did you focus to do exhibitions? Like how did you feel uh, things um, took well, its next um, step? When, when I was first, yes, when I was first coming back from Japan, um, a friend of mine, Ian Mackay, um, he was at Sturt Workshops at the time mm. and he'd visited me in Japan on a couple of occasions while I was over there. And um, when I was coming back from Japan, he said, come and do an exhibition at Sturt. So I actually packed up a lot of the pieces that I'd made in Japan and shipped them back with me. And that was my first exhibition in Australia at Sturt Workshops. And that was a really good version of um, fine porcelain I'd made in Kyoto. And, um, you know, I, I, I kept supplying Sturt for a few years with a variety of things. Um, but, you know, people who work there and the administration change over time. So that all seems to have disappeared at the moment. Mm. In fact, galleries around Australia have largely disappeared compared with what they were uh, back in the 80s. Uh, a lot of them have just gone. Um, I've done a lot of exhibitions over the years. I've done a lot of workshops. Um, I've written a lot of articles for publication. Um, you just do what you can. And uh, I've worked uh, filling in for uh, teachers who go on long service leave and spent a term working in a, a private school and things like that at, at times as well. Um, you have to do whatever you can to survive. Uh, it was really tough at one stage when my children were very young and I went back and did a diploma of education and um, thought I'd go in and try and do some, some teaching, but it was almost impossible to get a position as an art teacher. So I thought, well, why not use my language skills? So I went back to Monash, did postgraduate studies in um, applied Japanese linguistics, completed a master's degree, and then tried again in another private school. But I found that really hard. I, while I was at university, I used to lecture, um, you know, first year university students and second year university students learning language. But um, they were always interested and wanted to be there. And that was, a, that was easy to do. But you get into a high school and you get um, hormonal year seven and eights and uh, year nines and they sure don't want to be in the class most of them. That was, that was really tough. I didn't like that at all. So basically after 12 months of trying really hard, I went back to being a potter. And, um, you know, I've always, I've taken on students 
uh, I've get regular students coming, um, though not in the last year. The last year with COVID, it's been very quiet, mm. and um, I've had I've had no one in my studio at all. And um, you know, I've I've had a major exhibition at a good gallery in Melbourne a few years ago. Um, that was a good thing to do. At the moment, I'm actually on the lookout for a good gallery for three years' time because um, I want to have my 50th, 50-year exhibition somewhere. And I'd like to be able to find a good gallery to do that in. And the other thing I'm doing at the moment is working on a, a book. I'm writing a book about my past history and um, the background of my grandparents and parents, and also looking at the techniques of how to make your own tools and how to make porcelain and um, if I can complete this with a lot of images in time for a book launch uh, with an exhibition um, I think that would be a really good goal to work towards. Yeah so, uh, that sort of information is really important to uh, develop an archive because a lot of that uh, is either taught one-on-one -on -one or privately uh, or there's a lot of misinformation that teaches the wrong methods. Um, oh, yes, I know that very well. Yes. There are a lot of <laughs> students who come to me that have started somewhere and they've got it all wrong. <laughs> and you've mm. got to start them again from scratch. I, I even had one student who was throwing on the wrong side of the pot. And um, I said, you can't throw like that. The clay's coming into your fingers and not out of them. And she was wondering why she was mucking up her pots all the time. <laughs> no, there's there's a lot of very, very bad teaching in Australia uh, by by lecturers who really haven't had the the experience in the mm. industry or haven't been taught properly. Um, you go to somewhere like Japan and the standard of or the quality of the work over there is just so, so far above anything that's out here as a general rule. Um, they really laugh at what a Western pot is doing sometimes. They can't understand it. Um, and, you know, when you've been there for some years, you can understand why. But, of course, we've got some really good potters here, but a lot of them are getting older. Mm. Yes, yes. Um, you know, that is definitely the case. Down the road. I've got a, yes. I've got a potter, you know, who's only 40 minutes away from me who is a world-class potter working in an area that I'm not going to attempt because he's so good at that. Um, that's Ted Seacombe, who does beautiful crystalline yes. work. But he's essentially a self-taught potter. He never went to ceramic school. He started off as a, a biochemist. So that's why his chemistry is so good. And he's achieving such amazing glaze effects. But he's a good potter. There's, um, you know, there's quite a few of the old school that are largely self-taught, but um, when I see them working, sometimes I think, gee, I could, I could show you a shortcut for doing that. <laughs> there's a mm. better way to throw that, or there's a better way to turn it. But um, I'm careful not to try and in place, place my standards on other people. They've, they've learned their own way. But that's the thing um, with uh, a lot of uh, potters. In Australia, like Ted, they've really, well, I know that he's definitely put the hard yards into his own practice, uh, whether it's, um, you know, whether you're self-taught or not. He, if you put those hard yards into developing those foundational skills, it does pay off in the long run. But a lot of... Oh, absolutely. Yes. A lot of people don't want, don't have the, um, the patience. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Well, see, a lot of what I do requires a great deal of patience mm. and time. Um, you know, I make a lot of uh, porcelain setters to actually farm my work on. They're called Tochin. Some of them are firing bowls that are upside down on their rims. They're rim fire setters or they're, they're normal upright setters. And when the work's finished, nobody gets to see them, but they're very important to help especially with very fine porcelain, they're important to help to stop things warping. And they're made from the same clay that the, the piece is made. Often the setter has got as much, if not more, clay in it than the actual item. Mm. So I use all my reclaimed porcelain for making the setters. But um, 
Yes, no, it's, uh, I often tell my students the first 10,000 pots are always the hardest. You've got to <laughs> and persist then, and keep practicing. They'll say like 10,000. <laughs> yeah. You'd be surprised how fast you get through 10,000. Mm. <laughs> and look, the other thing that I'm really um, keen on trying to impart and teach to other people is the art of tool making. You know, there's certain things you can go to a ceramic supplies and buy but it's all very generic and it's often made by people who have no idea what they're making or how they're really supposed to be used. And um, especially with porcelain, but also with a lot of other clay, if you make your own tools to your own designs and you have the beautiful Japanese bamboo measures, uh, Japanese ceramics and also Chinese is all made to the internal measurements and the internal shape, not the outside. So it's opposite to the Western way of thinking and um or well, I've, I've got tools that go back you know 30 or almost 40 years and I've, I've had people come back after 20 years and say oh look we broke a few of this set and i say oh that's okay i can get the tools out and i can remake that for you because i've got them mm. Whoops. <laughs> excuse the noise you're right, you're right. <laughs> I'll turn it off. But no, uh, to me, tool making is a very important skill for a potter to learn. Mm. And it actually really makes a big difference in the making of your pots. And you can create your own shapes and your own sets of tools. So it's one thing I'm quite keen to impart the knowledge of and keep working. Well, I definitely hope that um, the, hopefully the book that you're working on uh, will be able to contribute more uh, and be developed more and hopefully launched. <laughs> That's one one thing I'm definitely looking yes. forward to. Uh, you you have Some, um, something else. Um, uh, I I saw on Facebook you have a event coming up soon. Is that the um the gallery exhibition you mentioned earlier? Um, look, there is a small gallery exhibition that I'm doing that's actually starting this week. That's just a local one. Right. But I'm actually putting a proposal in for an exhibition next year that has the theme of tea. And I'd like to look at that from an Eastern as well as a Western point of view. You know, you've got your English high tea and um, everything that that entails with uh, cucumber sandwiches and little <laughs> plates and lovely cups and saucers and teapots. And then you've got the West, the Eastern tea. There's actually two main varieties of that. The Sencha, which is usually fine porcelain and beautiful fine porcelain teapots and cups. And then there's Matcha, which is the, the tea bowls. And the variety of tea bowls in Japan is astronomical. And um, I've got a close association with the Ura Senke Tea School in Melbourne. So um, I can, I'm sure I can persuade some of the tea ladies to come out and do tea ceremony during the exhibition and show how it's done properly. Because that that's a whole, you know, other philo philosophical way of looking at tea. Mm. Um, I've got a beautiful little book in my library that's all about East and West and tea and how it's it's really there to sort of bring people together and um you know the samurai in japan may have been enemies at times but they'd come in and they'd drink tea and um you know, there was no fighting you had to leave all your swords outside in the tea ceremony and um you know tea was very much a peaceful place where people could meet and talk and appreciate tea <laughs> If you need to take that, we can wrap that up now. Wrap this up now, if you want. Oh, I could keep talking for a few more hours if you like. <laughs> <laughs> I've got lots I can say, but um, um, yes, yeah, so it's uh, someone's being very persistent. So okay, maybe yes, that's all right. That's all right. Maybe we can continue this at another point. <laughs> yeah, no, you'd be most welcome. I've got lots I can talk on. I'd love and, to talk uh, if you're down this way, you're most welcome to come visit the studio. Um, yeah, I'm planning I'd definitely a wood love firing. to. Yes, I'm planning a wood firing on the 5th of next month. And um, some of my students are going to put a few things in. So I'm looking forward to that. 
I won't be able to be there on the fifth. <laughs> That's a bit short notice of it for a month, but right. <laughs> uh, hopefully there'll be, a, there'll be a few there'll be a few more wood firings during the winter. Oh, beautiful, beautiful, awesome. Well, thank you very much, Alistair White. It's a, a pleasure to have you. Um, uh, what's the best way for our audience to um, follow your work? Because you're listed on a few different um, social media sites. Um. Probably the easiest way to keep track of me is on Instagram, Alistair under slash white. Um, I'm, that's where I post the most of what I'm doing at any one time. Yep. And, um, you know, I've even sort of moved into the realm of um, bronze at times. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll wrap that up now and um, I'll let you take that call. Thank you very much, Alistair. It's been a pleasure talk talking today. Thank you. Likewise. Cheers. Bye. Right, bye.